This is the BQBX, a 3D printer currently on Kickstarter and natively compatible with Octoprint using a large touchscreen. This is also a BQBX. So why do I have two and is it worth backing? BQ, better known as Big Tree Tech, is the latest established 3D printer manufacturer to use Kickstarter to launch a new model. Previously, I covered the Creality CR6 SE, which enjoyed a very successful Kickstarter campaign, and I believe the first models are now with customers. As with any Kickstarter, you're probably wondering whether it's worth the gamble or not of pledging your hard-earned money. So in this video, we're gonna go through my experiences from unboxing, using, and pulling apart to see if the BQBX is worthy of your consideration. We'll also explain why they had to send me two. As mentioned, the BQBX is now available on Kickstarter with just under two weeks to go. As you can see, it's already successfully funded, so presumably if you back it, you will be receiving one. There's a usual type of marketing video, Quite often we have to take these with a grain of salt. For instance, anyone that knows 3D printing knows that this T-Rex skull was not printed in this orientation and without support material. To back as an early bird will cost you 309 US dollars plus shipping. And based on the specs of the printer, you do get a lot for your money. The main board has a very fast 32-bit CPU. It also has a Hameraclone extruder, except lighter and more compact. Some things that aren't obvious to look at a 0.9 degree stepper motors that should offer twice the resolution of what 3D printers normally have, but by far the biggest point of difference is the large touchscreen. It's 7 inches in size, offers Marlin mode, the Big Tree Tech touchscreen mode, and connectors on the back to insert a Raspberry Pi and run Octoprint with touchscreen integration. My BX was sent free of charge by Big Tree Tech for the purpose of making this video. It is an early model, and that means it comes with no manual, no instructions, and no slicer profile. It was well packaged with custom pieces of foam to hold the components in place during shipping. The touchscreen was particularly well packaged, coming in its own box with custom foam inserts. And on the back, we can see the mounting position for the Raspberry Pi. The frame is still your usual V-slot extrusion, except with a carbon fiber pattern on the front of the vertical pieces, and we can also see some RGB LEDs hidden on the cross brace. Assembly without instructions was actually very easy. The upper frame sits on the lower base and uses four M5 bolts from beneath. Four M3 bolts secure the hot end and extruder combo to the X gantry. Another four bolts to secure the touchscreen. The filament spool holder bolts to the top of the frame. Cable management is neat with everything labeled and located right next to where it needs to plug in. All of the wiring for the hot end goes through an HDMI cable. And if we pull the bottom cover off the base of the machine, we can see a genuine Meanwell power supply. And we can also see that that HDMI cable goes the whole way in to plug directly into the main board. And we can access the main board fairly easily by removing four screws and sliding out the cover panel. Mounted to the main board a TMC2226 silent stepper motor drivers. While we're looking at components in detail, let's have a closer look at what I've called a Hamera clone. Inside we have twin feed gears, just like a Bontec BMG. There's a hand released lever, a manual wheel for pushing through filament, an inbuilt proximity sensor for auto bed leveling, integrated 4010 blower fan for part cooling with a duct, and a breakout board for all of the connectors to go up and out the HDMI port. I even spotted an unused filament detection plug. It's actually unfair to call this a Hamera clone because it's significantly smaller and lighter. If we hold them up to compare the length, we can see that the BX model is a fraction shorter, but when we compare stepper motors, we can see that the Hamera has a traditional NEMA 17, but the BX comes with a smaller NEMA 15. It's also worth noting that you need to add your own part cooling solution to a Hamera, but on the BX this is fully integrated as well as the auto bed leveling sensor. Compact and impressive. By default this hot end comes lined with PTFE tube from Capricorn, 
but if you want all metal, you can add an extra $12 to upgrade to an all metal heat break. Other features are easy to use belt tensioners and a magnetic spring steel removable PEI powder coated bed. Normally you would be ready to print about now, but considering mine was a development model, I needed to update to the latest firmware that Big Tree Tech had sent me. Now that powerful processor really is worth talking about. I've been adding to this table as I've produced videos and this MCU eclipses everything before it. On this early model, I needed to update the firmware with a special application, but I'm told a bootloader will be in place for easy SD card updating on the final printer and everything will be published to GitHub to keep it open source. I powered up the printer and worked out how to change the language to English. The TFT touchscreen interface is quite mature by now and really easy to use with the large 7 inch touchscreen. Before I could home and therefore print, there were a couple of small tweaks I needed to make. X and Y use sensorless homing and I needed to play with the sensitivity until I found a suitable value of 90 and I was able to do this by sending an M914 from the inbuilt TFT console. The other thing I noticed is that the ABL sensor was sitting just below the tip of the nozzle, so I adjusted the height upwards by moving the nuts on the mounting system. This let me successfully home and then run the ABL sequence for the first time. The included filament was actually TPU. This flexible filament was easy to load by using the hand lever and then the thumb wheel to purge the old filament. As usual with a printer that has ABL, on your first print you need to tweak the Z offset to get the correct first layer. Once this was done, the print continued on successfully until I realised the sample roll had tangled. The reprint did come out well, as did this Falcon clamp, apart from the fact I printed it too small and fused, as well as this Baby Yoda model. These prints were done from a combination of the TFT interface and the Marlin LCD mode. It has the exact same functionality as a normal Marlin LCD, except the graphical interface is reworked for the larger screen. I did have some bugs, like the USB flash drive not showing up from the TFT menu, and showing up but not having any files accessible to print from in Marlin LCD mode. I also had an SD card become corrupted after trying to print from it. Nevertheless, I pushed forward and decided to try the integration with Octoprint. We start by setting up an Octoprint installation exactly as you would on any other printer. If you're unsure on that, I'll link my most recent guide in the video description. After entering your Wi-Fi details in the Pi's configuration, we'll be ready to install the Raspberry Pi onto the back of the TFT. This involves removing two ribbon cables from the back of the TFT, plugging in an adapter board, reinserting the two ribbon cables into that, the small one being tricky but doable, and then selecting one of the HDMI adapters that came with your kit, plugging that into the Pi, the adapter into the board, and screwing everything down. We then power the Pi by plugging in a USB cable from the dedicated port into the power input and we plug in a second cable between the Pi and the expansion board so the two can communicate. I tidied up my wires with some cable ties, reattached the touchscreen and powered up the printer. At this stage, Octoprint will be exactly as you're used to. You can install plugins, upload files and start prints. But if you want to use the touchscreen instead of just sitting on the console, we need to follow the instructions to install OctoBTT as found on the Big Tree Tech GitHub. This involves following commands and typing them into an SSH client such as PuTTY or I guess you could plug in a keyboard and do it on the TFT screen. Everything did install, although I didn't have the LCD resolution set up properly at this stage, but that wasn't the biggest problem, as one of the USB ports had broken off the back of the adapter. It was pretty clear to me that the first BX I was sent was a pretty early prototype model and there's no way I could recommend it based on my experience. By that stage there were a lot of support emails back and forth with myself and Big Tree Tech. Rather than try and fix all of the issues with dated hardware, they instead elected to send me this newer BQBX which should be more representative of what a backer would receive on Kickstarter. So was it improved? Let's find out. So here we go again with an updated BQBX, 
This one apparently much improved. Still no installation manual, but assembly really is straightforward, taking around 10 minutes. I still had to adjust my sensorless homing sensitivity, but this time the ABL sensor was installed at the correct height and I didn't need to make any adjustments. I could also access and print from the USB drive and both SD cards. So the little niggles had been fixed, but what about any broader changes? The first printer had a belt assembly, locking the twin Z axes together up the top, but on this updated model, this was missing. And that's because each Z axis is now driven by its own stepper motor driver. The biggest and best changes were in the touchscreen and Raspberry Pi integration. Originally, my board was version 1, but this time round I had the newer version 2. And as the back said, this meant I could switch between three modes from the TFT. The Pi adapter board had also been updated, and the USB cables to connect everything were now more appropriately sized. Installation of the Pi was much improved, with no need to change the ribbon cables, just the adapter into the TFT, the HDMI adapter into the Pi, plug those two together, and then secure it with two screws. The cable on the left feeds the touchscreen inputs back to the Pi, and the cable on the right is to power the Pi. After flashing a fresh Pi image, I worked back through the slightly updated instructions for Octo BTT. I still didn't have the display right between the Raspberry Pi and the TFT, but then Big Tree Tech directed me to some extra instructions at the bottom of the README, and I'm happy to say that that fixed the problem. I found the Octo BTT interface a little bit limited. Some of the buttons were too small to press nicely, there's no specific display mid print, and the control menu has buttons which aren't very intuitive. It was however reliable, the print finished successfully, and it's an awesome Falcon planetary gear clamp. I really like these mechanical print in place designs, link for this one in the description. I then thought I'd try out an alternative UI for Octoprint, called Octodash. The interface for this looked a lot cleaner, but the main draw card for me was the super easy installation, simply copy this one line, paste it into the terminal and hit enter. After rebooting, I was met with the setup screen to complete the installation. Only one problem, no on-screen keyboard. You can complete the installation via SSH, but I had a little USB keyboard lying around, so I used it to complete the initial setup. Octodash is a more established product and therefore the interface is a lot slicker. You can access any G-code files you've previously uploaded to the Raspberry Pi. The general UI is clean and easy to follow, with the control menu being intuitive. And to cap it off, there's a fair amount of customization, including settings, custom buttons, as well as overall themes. Furthermore, when you're printing, you get a specific screen, and when you tap that, you can bring up the adjust menu to change temperatures, feed rates, and even do baby stepping. In this configuration, the printer worked flawlessly, and to make the most out of Octoprint, I tapped two of the holes in the left-hand extrusion, printed out this Ender 3 webcam mount, and installed it to the left-hand side of the printer, which allowed me to complete some Octolapses. Set up like this, the printer was making a lot of sense and performing very reliably. The prints were coming out quite well also, especially considering I was just using an Ender 3 simplified 3D profile with reduced retraction to suit the direct drive hot end. PETG printed fine and had no trouble sticking, but I did break this part trying to separate the two halves. The PLA reprint worked out really well. This printer would benefit from some tuning, but there's nothing in these tests that worries me. Even so, I've still suggested some improvements to the printer. There's three fans that are permanently spinning while the printer is idle. It's not the loudest thing ever, but if the printer is intended to sit with the power on running Octoprint, it's less than ideal. The positioning of the power cable to the Pi puts it on a nasty angle. When I sent this picture to Big Tree Tech, they responded that they will be changing the cable to alleviate the problem. When I was switching from Marlin LCD mode back to the Raspberry Pi mode, I noticed that the Pi was rebooting even though I hadn't asked it to. It was soon discovered that when you change away from Pi mode, the power to the Raspberry Pi is actually cut. When I powered the Raspberry Pi with an external 5V power supply, I noticed this flickering on the screen, 
I assume the HDMI signal is still coming through from the Pi, and that's why the engineers chose to cut the power. Therefore, it's currently important to shut down the Pi first before switching off the power or switching touchscreen modes. When I expressed to Big Tree Tech that I thought this was a deal breaker, after a couple of days they informed me they had found a workaround that should find its way into the final printer. Not perfect, but a vast improvement. Mechanically, this printer seems really strong. The Hemericlone hot end is small, lightweight and easy to use. Probably my only complaint is this HDMI cable, which at the moment dangles around and potentially could knock off your printed part, but apparently that's going to be improved as well. Considering I was using this printer without an instruction manual or any slicer profiles, my initial results are pretty promising. The touchscreen interface is large and easy to use, with the fallback of having Marlin mode for that extra functionality. The major point of difference on this is the Octoprint integration, and once that issue is fixed where the power is cut, I think it's going to be pretty seamless. I'm also really pleased that you're not locked into using OctoBTT, and instead you can use Octodash or another UI with the touchscreen, as I did here. If you were considering backing this on Kickstarter, a strong reminder that a Kickstarter is not a guaranteed purchase. You'd hope that an established manufacturer would have a better chance of delivering the product on time, but ultimately there are no guarantees and it is somewhat of a gamble. Have you got any thoughts on this BQBX? Do you think the Octoprint integration is worthwhile? Please let me know down below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.